Alone in the Dark is an old video game series that had a reboot in 2008, and I think it was one of the most over-designed and over-ambitious big-budget AAA video games that has ever been released. Like, it might be easy to look at its bad review scores and its angry dude on the front cover and dismiss it as something boring or generic, but that actually couldn't be further from the truth. Instead, it feels like a game where behind the scenes every single crazy design idea that the developers could come up with was greenlit and implemented no matter what. It's just so weirdly complicated, like the sheer amount of mechanics it's trying to balance is equal parts compelling as it is completely absurd, and gameplay that you'd expect to be conventional is instead almost always very, very experimental. You kind of know that you're in for a weird time when one of the first things a game asks you to do is press a button to blink, which becomes an important mechanic later on in the game. With so much going on, it's hard to even know where to start with this, so I guess to paint a picture, think of it to be in the same vein as Resident Evil 4, where you would venture around a horror setting, uncovering what's going on by beating puzzles and killing zombies, or in this case, humans. That's humans with a Z. I know. Uh, aesthetically, this takes a lot of cues from that specific mid-2000s movie genre of schlocky, vaguely Christian-themed blockbuster adventure thrillers like Constantine or The Da Vinci Code or, funnily enough, the much-beloved Uwe Boll Alone in the Dark movie. Uh, the setting is Central Park, New York, and the villain is none other than Lucifer himself, who's beginning the apocalypse and it's up to our amnesiac protagonist, Edward Carnby, to figure out a way to stop him. The story is poorly told, where it's mostly just chasing MacGuffin and even if you do follow it, it just doesn't really make much sense anyway. Just enjoy it for the edgy, awkward, and corny dialogue. Like, everything that Carnby says is great. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway! I'm the Light Bringer! I'M THE FUCKING UNIVERSE! Now, the original 1992 Alone in the Dark was groundbreaking back in its day. It was one of the first games to sort of put polygonal 3D models on pre-rendered backgrounds, and it's not an overstatement to say that it was a blueprint for the survival horror genre. Like, really, Resident Evil in a lot of ways just expanded upon what Alone in the Dark was doing, and with a legacy like that, it naturally spawned sequels and reboots like this 2008 one, where the developers stressed that they wanted this to be very ambitious and very innovative, just like that original game was. Uh, a French developer named Eden Games made this, who were a subsidiary of Atari at the time, and they were well known for racing games of all things, with the V-Rally series and a personal favourite of mine with Test Drive Unlimited, and they did at least have a third-person action-adventure game sort of thing under their belts with a decently received PS2 game called Kaya Dark Lineage from 2003, which was the same year that this Alone in the Dark game started pre-production. So as far as how this plays, you press a button to switch between first and third person, where you can only do certain things in each perspective. Like you can only shoot your gun in first person, but you can only do the Uncharted-esque platforming or use melee weapons in third person. So rather than sticking with your preferred perspective, you're constantly swapping between them, and it must have been a lot of work to implement and balance both perspectives. Uh, at the core of the combat is fire, because you can only kill most enemies by burning them. If you don't burn them, you'll just knock them out for about 20 seconds, and they'll get back up again with full health. So what you can do is grab a melee weapon that you can set on fire, like a chair or a wooden plank, hold it above some flames to set it on fire, and then hit enemies with it. Uh, alternatively, you can knock an enemy out, and then drag their body into a fire. If there's no fire nearby, you'll need to make your own using the items in your inventory. Uh, throughout the game, you'll find stuff like spray cans and bottles of alcohol and flammable liquids that you can throw and shoot in midair as an explosive, or with the spray cans you can dual wield them with a lighter to make a makeshift flamethrower, or you can pour a trail of fuel along the ground and then light it, or you can combine a bottle with a handkerchief to make a Molotov using the inventory system where the game doesn't pause as you literally look down inside your incredibly well-pocketed jacket. Uh, already you can probably see this is getting pretty complicated. Uh, the different ways you can make fire is surprisingly versatile and there's something satisfying about combining everyday objects to make makeshift weapons when your pistol isn't necessarily your most useful option. 
It's all supported by what was the most impressive fire physics system in a video game at the time, especially since this was released a few months before Far Cry 2. Uh, fire naturally spreads between flammable objects, and those objects, whether they're furniture or doors or cars, will char, crumble, and explode in fitting ways. There's still a novelty to seeing this fire system in action, and really the amount of destructibility in this game is also still very impressive. Like, it feels like every object in a room can either burn or fall to pieces because they mostly can and it's great seeing bathroom stalls get torn completely to shreds or bosses wiping out pillars in a room. Twilight 2 is the name of the engine this is running on, which was a modified version of Eden's in-house engine that they made for Test Drive Unlimited. And alongside the fire system, they ticked a lot of technical boxes here with stuff like the hair physics and the rope physics and the basic clothes physics and normal mapping and screen space reflections and basic water physics and object buoyancy in water and ragdoll physics and lots of particle effects and a massive use of pretty advanced dynamic lighting for the time. Like, it's, it's doing a lot. Uh, before the game came out, the engine was teased with a series of video tech demos and dev diaries that made a bit of a splash at the time because of all this stuff it could do. Like, I guess much like the way the game is designed, the engine itself was also tailored to balance a lot at once, and the whole project was actually shut down once during development by Atari until Eden could put together a tech prototype just to prove that they could even pull these concepts off. Like fire, light plays a big role here too. There are often pitch black areas that need to be lit up with either your torch or a glow stick or flames, and there's this demonic black goo that kills you if you touch it and only appears in the shadows, so they designed a few puzzles around needing to light the goo up, like one where you shoot hanging lights to make them swing, giving you a window to go through the goo, which warps and animates pretty impressively for the time. I know this is all sort of a lot to take in, and we've really only scratched the surface of the sheer volume of stuff there is to talk about in this game, but I think by now you've likely realized that this is trying to be something of a systems-based immersive sim style of game. Like there's a logic to how things like fire and light and destructibility all interact and work, and it's up to you to navigate that logic to take out enemies and find a way forward. You'll get stuck trying to get through a locked door thinking that you need a key, before realizing you can just bash it open with a bin, or shoot out the lock, or even burn down the entire door. At one point, I found myself in Central Park with a few zombies, or humans I should say, slowly walking towards me. It was moody, it was hard to see, and it was the first real time that the game let go a bit and left me to my own devices to figure out a way to survive. You could say that I was left alone in the dark. Uh, I had this moment where my instincts kicked in and I started running through the possibilities on how I could handle the situation. Like, did I have enough time to look in my jacket and cobble together a Molotov? Uh, is there a weapon nearby that I could burn and then maybe whack these guys with? Or should I maybe try and knock them out and then burn them? Or knock them out and make a run for it? Or ignore them entirely and make a run for it? Uh, it was this wonderful moment where I genuinely started making these micro decisions like I was in this world and thinking about what tools that that I had at my disposal to survive. The blend of inventory management and using the weapons and fire sources in my environment had me feeling like I was there in this hellbound central park, logically keeping track of what I could do and running through what I should do, which was genuinely immersive and only helped by the more minimal heads up display pulling me in even further. I love that this game shares similarities with games like Far Cry 2 or the King Kong game in that it takes a lot of the basic systems based design elements from older deeper immersive sim RPGs like Deus Ex or System Shock, but it frames itself as a more accessible action-adventure game. The other question that I asked myself in that moment in Central Park was, should I try to run for the nearby car to escape? Because on top of everything else, of course this game also tries to tackle driving, and of course it does a lot of unconventional things with it. Uh, if a car is locked, you have to shoot out the window to unlock it, and then once you're in, you can interact with almost everything inside. It's like Shenmue levels of just poking at things because you can. Like, you can change to any seat, and you can open the glove box, or turn the light on, or turn the radio on, that sort of thing. 
If there's no key in the ignition, you can check the sun visor to see if the keys are up there. Otherwise, you have to play a trial and error hot wiring mini game where the wrong wires might honk the horn or turn the inside light on, which can attract the zombies outside. I'm calling them zombies from now on. So if you're being chased and you're running for a car, there's a lot of tension in firstly hoping that it's unlocked and then hoping that there's a key for it. And if not, hoping that you'll be able to hot wire it quickly. Like it's genuinely very, very tense scrambling around the dash and putting those wires together and timing the ignition while there's zombies banging on the car windows outside. But then the actual driving itself is completely terrible, which is weird since this was made by a developer of racing games. It's slippery and unnatural and it'll glitch out when you crash into nothing pretty often and clearly it's very unfinished. Uh, all of this effort went into detailing all these little complexities inside the car and even outside the car you can pierce the fuel tank if you have a sharp object and then siphon fuel into bottles if you want to, or you can shoot the fuel tank to blow up the car. Oh and cars have surprisingly complex destruction models too where the entire roof of a car can come clean off but then it's all a bit for nothing when driving these things is so ridiculously bad. They knocked it out of the park with the more abstract ideas here but they could couldn't get the basics right at all. Which is a running theme with this game. There's all these wonderful, high concept, fascinating design ideas going on that are mostly executed pretty well, but then the first person aiming accelerates all weird and you move with a strange heavy momentum and it has a tiny field of view with massive head bob and each button seems to do like 10 different things depending on context. Uh, if you try to reload your pistol while holding onto a rope, for example, you'll instead jump off the rope and fall to your death. And the main action button does nearly everything. It opens doors, it presses buttons, it picks things up. Uh, good luck navigating inch by inch to pick up that one plank of wood you want while you're surrounded by three other things that the game thinks you want too. Or have fun trying to select something inside the car where each slight camera movement will have you selecting a new thing. And the weapon swinging is just bonkers. Like you've probably noticed that the animations are all out of whack and that's because rather than using a simple button press to attack, you instead lock onto enemies and waggle the right stick to swing, hoping that it registers your waggle as an attack. Like sometimes it's cool and pretty innovative that you can precisely move objects around in your hand. Like there's certain puzzles that require you to do it or it's good for holding something above a fire to set it alight. But most of the time it's just annoying trying to get it to work properly in combat because it can struggle to realize your intentions and the lock-on often doesn't actually lock on. You'll also struggle to fit through doors while you're holding something as you'll need to maneuver everything through. It's not a terrible idea on paper, but its implementation is just too sloppy, although it is fun when you get to swing a museum's swords and maces around. Across the board, Alone in the Dark 08 is just very, very janky and awkward to play. The platforming can be unreliable, the way it forces you to switch perspectives can be disorienting, the torch is completely useless in third person because it doesn't aim where the camera is aiming, uh, movement is sticky, but it's especially sticky when rooms can fill up with physics objects that you need to trudge through. There's way too many instant death pits with the platforming, or if you touch that black goo for even a second, you immediately die. Again, it just really, really struggles with the basics. Even on a technical level, this engine does so many cool advanced things, but then it just has slow down at seemingly random times and it has bad screen tearing on every platform and bad pop in. Like it seems that so much attention and care was put into all the high concept design and they simply neglected to make the game actually play well. Just in case there wasn't already enough going on in this game, there's also a wound healing system where you use healing spray, whatever that is, to seal up cuts, where that spray can also be used as an explosive, which can give you an interesting trade-off decision to make. Uh, if you take a big hit, you'll start bleeding out and you'll need to find a bandage within seven minutes to patch yourself up. You'll usually have a bandage on you, so it's not too much of a problem. So this kind of just feels like a glorified health pack system that just adds to the over complex weirdness that is Alone in the Dark 2008. Also, the wounds look really, really weird because they just seem to be textures on top of clothing, which is kind of funny. Like, Kanbi's just constantly covered in strange patches of flesh, even in the cutscenes. 
Early on, electricity plays a big role in the game, which again, there's just way too much going on here. Uh, a lot of puzzles require moving electric cables out of water, and there's even one which has you electrifying a fence to zap a bunch of zombie bats, but after that, electricity virtually isn't in the rest of the game. I imagine that it was intended to be more of a thing, like light and fire, but it just wasn't implemented outside of the more scripted early stages. You also do a CPR minigame exactly once towards the start, which I have to think was going to be a way to revive your AI companions that was simply never properly implemented. Uh, the game had a troubled development and it really shows. About two thirds of the game is a linear A to B blend of combat puzzles and platforming and the other third is set in the small but larger than you'd expect open world area of Central Park where zombies, items and vehicles are scattered around. The story flatlines when you reach the open world chapters late in the game as it sort of makes you run around and tick off a list of boring objectives and a barrage of boring text messages replace the fun but bad cutscenes. It feels very much like padding or like they simply ran out of time or money to do these sections properly. But when you factor in that this game has crafting and driving and healing and lots of inventory management, there's a lot of parallels here to the whole open world survival genre that dominated the 2010s, only this was back in 2008 and playing it back then was something of a treat that turned out to be pretty ahead of its time. The only time I didn't have a bandage while bleeding out was in the open world, so suddenly I dropped everything I was doing to rush for a car and scour every bin, bathroom and wreckage while avoiding getting killed by zombies, and it was a real thrill. I, I kept finding healing spray which only paused the bleed out timer for a bit, and I got so desperate that I started breaking into new cars and scrambling around in their glove boxes for a bandage as the heartbeat sound and music ramped up. It was tense. Unfortunately, I never actually found a bandage and I bled out and died because the rate at which you find some items is just super rare, especially in the open world. You can pierce fuel tanks, but good luck finding the handful of screwdrivers or knives that seem to be in the game to do it. Or there's blood packs that you can throw where zombies will crowd around them, but those are also way too rare. Instead, it's mostly just bottles of alcohol and glow sticks that you'll keep accidentally picking up. And once you get a feel for how the inventory works, most problems can be solved by throwing a bottle and shooting it in the air. Whether you need to blow something up or knock something down or burn something or take out an enemy, throwing and shooting will do the job 95% of the time, which eclipses any purposes of the more interesting combinations. You can also pour alcohol on bullets to shoot fire bullets, which also solves way too many problems, but it is at least so stupid logically that I think a lot of people who played this probably never figured out that it was a thing. Like, I'm not sure Mythbusters need to check if pouring whiskey on bullets makes fire bullets. Speaking of bad logic, if you wrap double-sided tape around a Molotov and throw it at something, it will stick to it. It doesn't matter if it's a glass bottle, it doesn't matter how hard you throw it, it'll stick. I remember the first time I played this game years ago, I got stuck at a puzzle which required me to throw a sticky Molotov at a headcrab because it's 2008 and of course this has headcrabs, and then that headcrab would go back to its nest and blow it up. It's kind of a neat puzzle, but it requires you to put together the nonsense logic of the game, which, like the fire bullets, I just dismissed as being too silly to be possible at first, and it never explicitly tells you that you can do these things. Holistically, Alone in the Dark 2008 is an extremely uneven game with an incredible amount of fascinating design ideas that I think it deserves credit for at least attempting, and if you're the patient type who might be interested in this, then I think it is worth checking out because it's not as annoying to play as you might expect for a few reasons. 24, Lost, and Prison Break were all cited as inspirations for the way Alone in the Dark is told, where they split the game into chapters, sort of like TV episodes, where each one ends with credits and they let you fast forward and rewind to virtually any checkpoint in the game that you want, and every time you do you'll get a previously on recap of what's going on. So if you're bored of the open world sections for example, just pause the game and load the next checkpoint. It could be argued that like the survival stuff, uh, this episodic stuff was also ahead of its time to some extent since episodic games became a big thing too, and just as an aside it might be a complete coincidence, but aesthetically Alone in the Dark 
Dark is weirdly similar to Alan Wake with its gloomy style and its use of light and its previously on clips and its TV show inspiration and its white dude in a grey jacket protagonist. Uh, the two games are just so weirdly similar that I had to mention it. Previously on Alone in the Dark. Meet me in room 943? Oh, fuck that, I'm leaving! Previously on Alan Wake. I'm the fucking universe! Even without skipping through, the checkpoints here are generally so generous that you never have to repeat much, the enemies are really slow to give you time to grapple with the bad controls, and a lot of the more linear stuff is either enjoyable because of its unusual design, even if it's not executed that well, or enjoyable because it's a cool set piece. I think this has one of the best train levels from before Uncharted 2's train level, for example, where you have to keep warding off a boss who's chasing you down as you make your way up to the front of the train while the boss keeps destroying carriages. It's fast and it's intense and it makes you think on your feet as you rush to put out fires and pick up weapons, and it's an exclusive level to the PS3 port of the game, which is by far the best version because it came out a bit later and, believe it or not, polished up a lot of the controls and glitches while making a few small but important gameplay tweaks. It's not quite as graphically impressive as the 360 or PC game, but having tried every version, the PS3 game plays so much better. The most memorable set piece in the entire game sees you driving through the streets of New York as the city crumbles around you, and it's super dodgy and frustrating because the driving is super broken, like you'll probably fall through the map at least once, but the spectacle of it really holds up, especially when coupled with the soundtrack that I can't speak higher about. Like against all odds, this is up there with my all-time favorite original video game soundtracks, as it, it combines like traditional Bulgarian choir singing with a heavy thumping orchestra and it's just amazing and it plays at all the right times. The music and the sound design here are both so great that they elevate every moment immensely. Combine all this with the schlocky, ridiculous story that gives you a laugh every now and then, and from start to finish, I couldn't stop playing Alone in the Dark, whether it was the first time I played it over 10 years ago, or for this current playthrough. At times, it's an immersive, atmospheric, and emergent experience, and at others, it might feel like a car crash that you can't look away from, no pun intended, but it's that roller coaster of nonsensical ideas and emotions that just has me compelled to see what it attempts to do next, even if it doesn't pull it off. Uh, I've been careful not to call this game underrated or a hidden gem because it, it's not that. It's, it's borderline broken and it bites off way more than it can chew, but I will say that its achievements and its ambition are overlooked. If you're the kind of person to daydream about unusual or experimental game design and you're willing to put up with playing a clearly unfinished game with a ton of problems, then you should absolutely get yourself into a forgiving mood and check out Alone in the Dark 2008, just to let your mind wander with all these awkward and fascinating ideas. There's nothing else quite like it. And there we wrap up the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. If you want to support, you can support in all the typical ways you can support most YouTubers. Uh, I didn't mention that there was a PS2 slash Wii version of this Alone in the Dark game that is pretty weird. Like, um, it's made by a different developer and all the characters have different voice actors. And I think some of the characters are just straight up different characters, but they play the same role. Like the girl in the game is a different character. I don't know, it's weird. I actually haven't played it, but it looks weird and it looks like something uh, that I will check out hopefully sometime. Uh, there was also a game, the, the other Alone in the Dark game that I've spent a decent amount of time with is called Alone in the Dark A New Nightmare, which is kind of the fourth game in the series, but it's sort of a soft reboot. Um, and I really think that game's underrated, so if you want to see me talk about that game, let me know also. It's sort of a a cool, it sort of, it sort of came out after Resident Evil and Silent Hill all sort of came around. It came out on the Dreamcast, the PS2 and the PS1 and the Game Boy Color, funnily enough. And it was, yeah, it was just a really, really solid, impressive 
uh, survival horror game. So yeah, I just wanted to talk about those. There was also this um, big sort of semi-scandal thing with how Atari got angry at reviewers for giving Alone in the Dark a bad review score and then reviewers fought back and it was this whole thing. There's like this Wikipedia section about it um, that is almost worth, I almost want to like start emailing people and asking them uh, what happened there to see if there might be a story in it because it's kind of a funny thing. I know that Atari did a similar thing with Driver 3. There was the whole Driver 3 gate scandal which was Atari vs. Uh, video game reviewers. Um, yeah, well, lots of interesting stuff. This whole game is just weird in every single way. <laughs> the whole series is really. There was a 2015 Alone in the Dark game as well that was, uh, that was terrible. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Uh, before going, I just want to quickly thank all my patrons. So thank you, patrons. Thank you to all of the patrons coming up on the screen. And especially thank you to my $5 patrons. I'm going to move the microphone over here. Alex Austin, Analog Man, Anthony Gallagher, Anthony Valiant, uh, Aradina Varen, Big J, Boggy Online, Cannondorf, uh, Connor Salinas, Dan Pierce, Daniel Gold, Devin Grandal, Dingo Dangle, Dominic Chikoki, Doe Pants, Down the Cat Hole, Evil Chicken, Felipe Magales, Gary Pay, uh, Hazardous Kirby, Ian Lockhart, Jared Kernop, Jay Gulls, Jenny McGlynn, Kane Ramsey, Kayla, uh, Lab Cat, Lucas Ray Savick, Mage in 1940, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Michael Brennan, uh, Mini Me comes from a land down under where women glow and men plunder. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sunday Movies. <laughs> Mustache, Duct Tape, Oscar, PK, Ponky Kong, Patrick Kirst, Peaceful Kumquat, Petersaurus, Pewix, Plague, uh, Riddlin' for Kids, Robbie Gregg, or Robbie Grieg, Ruth Knappman, Salakin Sequa, Sam King, Sam Liss, uh, Scott Hazlitt, Skyd Panthera, Spoofit, Serdan Kolakovic, Tio, Test Drive Unlimited 2, That Guy in Your Serial, The Last Great Opium Den, Tiksh, Trevor Corbin, Trixie Emerson, Truman DeRay, Wastelander997 and Zindictive, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I screwed half of that up as usual. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll see you all in the next video. Take care. Goodbye.